Pastor, I'll be sick. He calls me last night at 9 o'clock. He says, you're up. <laughs> so, well, here I am. And God willing, I'm going to preach to his people. And I look at you guys out here, and, and there's, there's guests, there's people I come to church with every Sunday. I love you guys. And I'm just so, so glad to be worshiping the Lord with you guys. But let's, let's pray and let's ask him for his help because I need it. Father, good king. We need you today. Satan would want to kill and to just instill and take our joy. And um, you would want this Sunday to be a flop. Um, but you are good, Lord. And I trust in you. And I just ask, Lord, that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us today. Let us hear what you have to say through your word. Let it not be my words, Lord Jesus. Let it be your words. You are a good king, and we need to hear from you. We come to worship you today. We come to honor you today. Uh, help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, I'm going to ask you guys to turn to 1 Samuel. We don't have the slides like we normally do. I wasn't about to try and tackle that along with everything else. I was already up till 2 in the morning. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through the first seven chapters just really briefly just to kind of catch us up to speed of what's going on. Um, the, the prophet Samuel, um, he... Um, is best remembered is the one that anoints the first king of Israel, Saul, and then later anoints David. Um, the first seven chapters starts out with the birth of Samuel. What is up with that? Anyways, it's not you. Um, he's born from the as the son of Hannah. And Hannah was one of two wives who was married to, and I'm probably going to butcher the names, but Elkanah. Um, she couldn't have children. And year after year she'd pray, Lord, give me a child. And finally she goes to the one day she goes to the temple and Eli's there and she prays. She's over there talking and she's praying like we do sometimes, not saying any words. And Eli thinks that she's drunk. And she says, well, I'm not drunk. And she explains to him, what, to him what's going on. And he says, okay, well, um, she says, I want a child and I'll be dedicated to the Lord if I have a child. And he says, well, go, go your way. Um, and hopefully the Lord will give you what you're ask, asking for. And, and he does answer her prayer. God does. And after the boy was weaned, she brought him to Eli the priest, that he may minister to the Lord. And in chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. And let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beth Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of God. Um, we then see the rejection of Eli. Um, and the priest, because of his disobedient children, they were doing some horrible things, um, drinking, partying. Um, and they're, they're priests, and they're supposed to be taking this offerings and stuff and, and working in the temple, and they're not. So God rejects Eli because he doesn't, um, he doesn't 
come to his children and stop them from doing what they're doing. So, and as it goes on, you know, you guys have all probably read the story. If not, read through it. Um, it's great. It's a great study. But Samuel's a boy, and the Lord calls him, and he comes into ministry. And anyways, that's a really rough, 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 rough estimate of the first seven chapters. And like I said, go through, study it out. Because where we're going to start, now that we've got a little bit of context, is chapter 8 in verse 1. <clears throat> when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his birth, firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when he, they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. <clears throat> See, Samuel was a good judge. He was one of the, the one of the last judges. This was the time of the judges, um, and then it's it's moving, it's transitioning to. Um, the time of the kings. And he was a good judge. He took idol worship out of, out of Israel. If we look at it, seven, go back to chapter seven, three, it says, if you are running to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and Ashtroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the the Baals and the Ashtoreth, and they served the Lord only. <coughs> but we see a different story with his sons. They, they were looking for gain. They were taking bribes. Um, they, they perverted justice. And this is a serious offense to take bribes as someone that's been put in authority as a judge. God takes this serious. And we see in Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 20, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God has given you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the, of the righteous. Justice and only justice shall follow. <coughs> that you may live in, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So God takes it serious. That's one of like 20 verses that I picked out on, on judges. So he takes that serious. If we look back at Eli, that was the reason why he was rejected in a in a uh, in a role of authority because his sons were not following and doing what they were supposed to. And in the same, we're seeing the same thing happen again. It's just a circle that's going on here. It was a boss. 
is taking basically bribes from other people and uh, in their friendship or in whatever it may be, and they're and they're pushing you to the side, you know, and they're and they're they're causing you to go do the the, the crappy jobs, and they're and they're letting these other people. I mean, I mean that's kind of a, the same example. Or with a cop pulling you over, and you know you didn't break the law, but he, but he still gives you that ticket, or or whatever it may be. Because see, God takes it's serious if you are in a, and if you are put in a, in in authority, you need to take that job seriously. You need to be fair. Anyways, we'll move on. Um, you see, in the next text, that this dis, this displeased Samuel. Um, that they wanted a kink, and. God says, they're not rejecting you, but me. Um, is this the reason why it displeased him? Probably, because God says. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Um, he's been a judge. He's been a good judge. So, I mean, that might have to hurt the pride a little bit. I mean, after all, Samuel is. He's a, he's a sinner. He's a, he's a good a good uh, prophet, a good um, speaker for God. He loves the Lord, but but still, that I mean, he says he says You're, they're not rejecting you; they're rejecting me. But I think there might be a little bit underlying of something else too that's going on there, and I'm just speculating. But they're not just rejecting God, uh, Samuel; they're also rejecting his sons. And I know Samuel probably is looking at this. And he's saying, and, and this, like I said, it's complete speculation. But I think we can learn something from this, even if it's um, not the case. They're coming to him, the elders of Israel, and they're saying, look, we want a king. Your sons are taking bribes. You're, they're doing this. They're not good judges. How many times have we been confronted by somebody about our children or about our spouse or about whoever it may be, and they're or parents for the kids, and, and even though we're in the wrong, or they're in the wrong, they uh, we get defensive. It's just it's just human nature. It's like what? My sons did what? Um, we can't be those parents that our kids. Don't do anything wrong. Can't be those parents. If we're doing that, stop it. God, God doesn't like that. And it's not doing any, any favors to our kids. If we're in the wrong, our family's in the wrong, we need to own up to it. That's what we do as, as a family. And that's what we are. We're, we're the body of Christ. We're, we're a family. If, if someone in, in our family is doing something wrong, we point it out to them. Don't get offensive. Take it and say, okay, I can see that. <coughs> but see, they did reject. They did reject the king when they did that. See, and I think that is probably the biggest reason that it, that it ticked off Samuel. See, because through all the judges, God set up. He set up these judges, but God was still the king. He pulled the people out of the land of Egypt. He had set them up in the promised land. He was the king. And he set up judges. See, God always works with order. God is not a God of confusion. We know that. He is a God of order. So he sets up things. But God is the king. And I think Samuel knew this. Because Samuel had studied the word of God. 
He knew the word of God, and he seen in uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17, 14, he knew that they was going to reject the king at one time. And he knew that the, the, the land of the, the Israelites were going to set a king up because Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 17, 14, which is way before this time. I don't know how many years, but it's a long time. And it says in Deuteronomy 17, 14, when you come to the land of the Lord, your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. See? Moses said that. He knew that they were going to set a king up. But it's still rejection of the king. The king was rejected despite all that God had done for Israel. They rejected him. We can look at this and we can be like, well, we're reading our Bibles. Israel did it again. The king was rejected. How easy it is to point fingers. How many times have we said when reading our Bibles, why did they do that? Can't they see? God's right in front of them, leading them. He's leading them with the pillar of fire at night, a cloud by the day. He's doing these miracles, and yet they still fall continually over and over again. They repent. They go. They fall. They repent. They go. They fall over and over again. And here they are doing it again. We don't want you, God. We want to be like the other nations. We want to have a king over us. And if you read on through there, after that, God, God says, okay, let them have it. But here's the warnings. I mean, they're going to have a king, and it's going to be a, a, a king that's flesh, a sinner. And he's going he's to draft you into the armies. He's going to do this. I mean, the list goes on and on. I and mean, you can read on it later. But, but he warns them. But yet still, they're like, we want a man to rule over us like the other nations. on our fingers. Why would this do that? Why? But the king was rejected. And later, turn to Luke 18, 28 through 40. And when he had said these things, they went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. He drew near to Beth, Bethany, Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet. And he said to of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, sent, were sent, went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And they brought it to Jesus. I mean, and, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawn near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is he, I mean, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Again, the king was rejected. They seen the miracles. 
the dead raised, the blind see, the lame walk. How could they reject him? Israel did it again. How easy is it us for a point? How easy it is for us to point out other people's sins continually. We do that, even if we can check our hearts. But the king was rejected. But not by Israel only, but by us also. All of us have rejected the king. Starting with Adam and Eve in the garden through today's time. Millions across the world, from every tribe and tongue and nation, are rejecting the truth that there is a good God who loves them and wants to be their king. See, Romans 3.23 tells us, All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <coughs> not the end. That's not the end of the story. We have all sinned. We have all rejected the king. <laughs> Chris, you mentioned earlier John 3.16. And I'm about ready to read John 3.16. I think we miss the point sometimes, guys. We try to we try to complicate it. When God's just telling us, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Or that's 323, sorry. That's a little bit later, but anyways. God is calling you, His Spirit is crying out to you through the pages of His Word. If you don't know this King Jesus, you're missing out. You are missing out. I missed out for many years. I didn't know Jesus. I, I thought I did. Um, he's worth it, guys. We need to stop rejecting the king. We need to quit being that. We need to break that cycle of generations, thousands of years of rejection of the king. Um, Adam and Eve did it. God set them up in a perfect place. Said, eat everything that you want here, but that one thing, don't eat that. Because if you do, it's not going to be good. You're going to die. Sin's going to come into the world. They rejected the king. They did it. And every, we just read through the Bible and we see it continually. They rejected the king. They rejected the king. They rejected the king. Even in the New Testament, they rejected the king. <coughs> and we need to stop this. If you don't know the king, you need to know him. It's, it's the hardest, simplest thing to know Jesus. It's so hard because we get our pride in the way. It's too easy. We just have to accept Him. But our pride, how hard is that? We can break through that pride. We can't do it on our own. We need the Spirit of God working inside of us. So as we're talking to people, pray that the Spirit will work in them. Romans 10.9, this is how easy it is. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If we don't reject him, if we confess him, this King Jesus, he came, stepped off his throne, he came. He died for us. He was betrayed by his closest friends. He was slaughtered. Isaiah 53, 7 tells us, like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a 
sheep that his forage shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That's not it. Our king didn't just die. He didn't just die. Death couldn't hold him. <coughs> He's alive. And he's here with us right now. And he loves us. And if you're not, if you're rejecting the king right now, if, if you're out there and you're rejecting him, if you're, if you're still there saying, I don't know, stop. He loves you. He wants you to be with him. And this is a short sermon. Like I said, it was, it was from 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock this morning. But there's a time coming. And I just want to close with this. There's a time coming, and I want everybody to look at a king in the future. Well, it's going on right now. It's not just the future, but it's going on right now. And we will be a part of it if we quit rejecting the king, if we, if we accept him for who he is and love him like he loved us. For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved us. And I'm going to read in Revelation chapter 4 just so we can see what, what we're going to be a part of one day. We're not going to see it cloudy anymore. We're going to see it clear one day. After this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carmelin. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an, an emerald. Around the throne were 24 elders seated on the thrones. Were 24, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling and pearls of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne were, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them had each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who was seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders, oh, sorry. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. See, when we accept the king, when we love the king because he first loved us, he proved that when he went to the cross. We... That's what we get to look forward to. We get to be in heaven. We get, we get to see these weird creatures that, these angels that I, I don't know how to explain. I haven't tried to draw a picture of that. I mean, um, we just need to love the Lord and we need to accept Him as King. And I know that most of us have here, and that's great. And 
just want to say I love you guys. And, um, thanks for letting me preach. I know it was short, but that's what I have. So let's pray and we'll close. And you guys can leave. So we'll have the worship team come up and pray. There's a singing song. Father, we just love you. And Lord, I know that your word spoken will never go out empty and void, Lord. I just pray that we would just learn from your word, that it would cause us to, to dig in and study, to study about Samuel, to study about um, who you are, Lord God, to study, just to study your word, study what you did in Samuel's life, to study what you did through the lives of the Israelites, and what you're still doing today, Lord. You are alive and active, and you are on your throne, Lord. We worship you. We sing to you praises, and we love you, Lord, and we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.